Hey guys, welcome back to Cretaceous Cast. I hope you enjoyed the last video on September from Prehistorica, and I'm going to be doing the second part on it today. I got uh, a few topics to talk about. Some pretty cool stuff happens in, in September, so I'm excited to talk about that. And then the next video is going to be made by Benji Thomas, and he's doing one on October. So, without further ado, let's get ready. Oh boy! So the first thing we're going to be talking about is Scipionics. It was an interesting thing that happened in September. Guess what? <laughs> it's another dinosaur that's that's gone forever. Just kidding. Man. <laughs> Not really. Uh, you know, instead instead of going the way of the dodo bird, you know. <laughs> it should be going the way of the troodon, you know what I'm saying? Five people got... So the paper on Scipionics comes from a guy named Andrea Ka. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, and it covered two different kinds of theropods that come from Italy, one of which was Saltria venator zanelli and Scipionix samniticus. And the first bit of the paper goes over Saltria venator a little bit, basically just talks about how it's a theropod that came from the early Jurassic. This critter comes from the Saltria formation. Gee, I wonder where it gets his name from, Saltria venator. If it wasn't for that, was it because it's a salty ceratosaurus? Just kidding, I'm sorry, that's third joke I've made today that's horrible. Uh, anyway, it was an earlier kind of ceratosaur, represented one of the... It was the beginning of the ceratosaur family, and basically the earlier part of the paper discussed how ceratosaurs started out as a tetanurin-like form. Tetanurins are basically a large group of theropods, so what it means by that is tetanurins are kind of a basic theropod. So uh, the paper went over how started out as a basic kind of theropod and how ceratosaurs eventually became what they are iconically known as, you know, the big horn and all that. The Saltria venator was said to kind of represent a form that was more bulky and big than how ceratosaurs became later on. And uh, the paper also uh, talked about a little bit how ceratosaurs don't really have arms that are that important for hunting. And so it suggested that that happened from earlier ceratosaurs in the family, such as Saltria venator, not using their arms during hunting as much, and so over time that meant that their arms would become reduced. So the real meat and potatoes of this paper comes from Scipionics, and so what the whole thing with Scipionics in this paper was is the author was suggesting that Scipionics might not be a compsognathid, compi, it might actually be a juvenile version of a carnosaur, particularly the Carcharodontosaurus. And so the reason he suggested this is because there haven't been any adult versions of Scipionics found, which is a little weird, and this happens with other compies in the family too. And so what he did was, is because of this weird thing, he ended up running two phylogenetic tests, one which considered compies a family, well, it, it didn't really put into consideration the fact that they were young, and then another test just kind of looked at them without considering them a family, and all the compies in that family ended up really far apart from each other on the phylogenetic tree. And so on this phylogenetic tree, Scipionics ended up where Carcharodontosaurs are. And the paper pointed out that some compies are actually, they're around as big as what juvenile versions of carnosaurs like Carcharodontosaurus would be expected to look like. And uh, the paper pointed out that Scipionics in specific had particular traits with its face bones, particularly the maxilla and premaxilla, has uh, five teeth on the premaxilla, and that is quite a bit like how Carcharodontosaurs are. The other paper I'm going to be talking about comes from Scientific Reports, and it covers two new kinds of Spinosaurs that were found, um, one of which was called Ceratosucops and Throdios, and the other was Rapara venator milneri. You know, Ceratosucops, it's kind of a funny name, like it sounds like a hybrid between Ceratosaurus, Sucomimus, and Triceratops. I wonder if Jurassic World Alive would ever tackle that. Um, but yeah, so essentially it was these two Spinosaurs lived alongside Baryonyx in the early Cretaceous. The paper goes over the problem that all these different kinds of Spinosaurs were living together at the same time by suggesting that they could have basically lived in different niches. Um, basically that, you know, they could have come out during different seasons of the year, or they could have just simply lived pretty far away from each other so they could technically live at the same time period. So the two new Spinosaurs from this paper, the bones found from them mainly are facial bones and tail bones. And they use those bones to differentiate them from other baryon baryonchines, which are the subfamily of Spinosauridae that has the dinosaurs like Baryonyx and Pseudomimus. And basically, the way they found them to be different is 
Um, Serratus Hukops and Rapara Venator are different from each other because of how their occipital condyle is put together. That's the bone at the back of the skull. Hold on one second. Let me get my... So right here, I've got my Velociraptor skull. Pretty cool. And at the very back of the head, right here, if you'll focus, that is the occipital condyle. And this is the bone that um, showed that Rapara Venator and Serratus Hukops are different from each other. The occipital condyle of these two dinosaurs is also a bit different from Baryonyx, so that's another way that they can be differentiated from Baryonyx. And uh, they also have holes in the skull at different spots than Baryonyx would as well. A cool finding in this paper that it goes over is that it suggests that um, Spinosaurus started out in England and they ended up diverging towards Africa. Um, and they found this out through paleogeographical reconstructions. Another cool thing that the paper went over is how there's been um, discourse in the paleo community about whether or not the subfamilies of Spinosaurinae and Baryonchinae can be separated from each other. And so this paper did some tests and stuff, including these new Spinosaurs, and it ended up concluding that they still do have that separation between each other. However, there are some certain factors that still need to be put into play. With these computer simulations trying to figure out what goes where in the family tree, there are some things for Spinosaurs that need to be, there need to be more of, and these are operational taxonomical units. And so currently those are kind of spotty. But so far it does still seem like Spinosaurs uh, have Baryonchines and Spinosaurines. So yeah, that's it for me for today. I hope you enjoyed. Um, make sure to like and subscribe and stick around if you want. The next video, like I said earlier, is going to be on Benji Thomas's channel. Remember, evolve or go extinct.